Michelle, if you'd be kind enough to make a, say a few, few words about uh, how this all transpired and what you do. Sure. It's such a blessing to be here. Uh, I'm the Service Navigator Team Lead for Autism Ontario. So my role is really to connect with community providers and with families and professionals to really find out what the needs are within the North. So in speaking with some of my colleagues and with some families that have previously attended uh, a workshop here with Kenneth Pope, the feedback was we could really utilize more of these. There's some really valuable information. It's not something we discuss on a regular basis. And I think it's something that we need to chat about a little bit more. So in putting a call out, uh, Kenneth was more than willing to support and, and devote some time to the following. So we are truly, truly grateful for this, Kenneth. Thank you so much. Uh, but it is my responsibility to bring these forward. So if you um, do have recommendations or other services that you would like to see bring uh, going forward, please make sure that you connect with me. My information is there. It, uh, it is my responsibility to represent the North. So I appreciate you taking some time to sit here and get this very valuable information. So thank you. We'll come to this again at the end. Perfect. Um, my law practice, our law practice, uh, specializes in working almost almost exclusively with uh, families who have kids with special needs or disabilities uh, all over the province and, and in other provinces and countries as well but primarily Ontario and we do such things as you'll see as we proceed that are there's about I think 13 things that we do specifically depending upon the family's needs the age of the child the age of the parent uh, the, the issues that are involved in the family situation and it's a, it's a lifetime spectrum basically because you know the we, we come into contact with our uh, our families uh, sometimes when the, the parents or the children are older often when they're young and as the, as the, the lifetime goes by uh, the child gets older, they become 18, they apply for, need to apply for ODSP, they leave school at age 21 and no, they're no longer uh, children so they no longer go to the children's hospital and they get into legal guardianship and powers of attorney and uh, wills and hence the trusts and uh, disability and caregiver tax credit recaptures and you know all of those things and then one day the second parent passes on uh, you have to set up the Henson Trust. Uh, maybe you maybe you help with probate and settling the estate. So it's it's a long term relationship. Um, I'd like to firstly give people a bit of context. And I see that uh, Diane and Karen are answering questions because they're coming up on the box and disappearing. Uh, to give you context, this is the number of people in Ontario. And this is the number of households approximately, because uh, what, what StatScan says is if you take the population and you divide by three, and this is kind of intuitive in a way, uh, that's how many households you'll have. And of course, we're, we're not necessarily dealing discreetly, uniquely with all 13.7 people, million people. We're dealing with the 10% roughly of the 4,566,000 households who have family members, kids, with special needs disabilities. So you can see here that um, for, for children 18 to 65, <clears throat> not including the, the minors and not including the seniors, there's 378,000 people on ODSP, which is a lot. And you can see the breakdown roughly here for these numbers. You can see borders. What this means is that 48,233 of the 378,000, so something like 13%, are at home with family, but the rest aren't. And for example, what we'll touch on, what these numbers tell us is that there's 48,233 kids at home with parents. And of course, they're uh, invariably receiving the room and board amount of uh, 896 instead of the shelter plus supplementary of 1169. So this is one of the things that we will touch on here that, that we try to deal with. You can see that um, there's very few owners, very few homeowners, and that's because a person on ODSP could own a home, 
uh, but they can't afford to carry it without supports. So you can be pretty much almost positive that all of these owners aren't paying all of the carrying costs of their house. It could be that they're being assisted uh, by uh, Hanson Trust in, in the will of their deceased parent, for example. Uh, this is the uh, breakdown. These are all st uh, ODSP uh, uh, statisticians uh, numbers. This is where we get them. Here's the breakdown of the types of disabilities and the numbers in each. So that's interesting too. I'm not quite sure where autism fits here. It's not really a developmental disability in, the, in most cases, although the, the child might well be involved with uh, Developmental Services Ontario, that could be. So to tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure where they get lumped in. I suppose it's probably with developmental disabilities. Although it's, uh, you know, I'm sure it's a large percentage if that's where it is, it's a large percentage of that number. And this is the breakdown by, by area, um, by municipal area. And these again are the numbers that allow you to calculate what percentage, what kind of numbers there are in each given area. And uh, Michelle and I were speaking earlier, just before the meeting, the get together here. Uh, where did uh, Sudbury go? It's someplace close, there we go. So there's, there's Greater Sudbury. And uh, Michelle tells me that I've been there, of course, and uh, so I got my own background, but I don't, I'm not current. I think the last time I was there was October about six years ago. And um, you can see here that if there's a population of 160,000 in, uh, in uh, Sudbury, that works out to 53,333 households. So 10% of that would be 5,333. Well, in fact, there's 6,688. And then the people in those benefit units total this number, but this is the number of benefit units as they're called. And this is the number of kids under 18 who are uh, in a low income household uh, typically under 45,000 a year, who are receiving what's called ACSD, which is assistance for children with severe disabilities. And it's really not based on severity, it's just on a low household income plus a disability. So you can see here that if 10% if of the households of Sudbury's, 5,333, and you have 6,688, obviously this is more than 10% of the number of households. And in this particular case, the reason for that is that Sudbury is a, a service center. People migrate there for services. Um, in other cases, you have places where people, able-bodied people, capable working people have migrated away. So the numbers are higher like Brantford and uh, Cornwall. Uh, there was a time in Cornwall and Brantford when it was, when it was the one in uh, five. I don't know if that's changed recently. Where's Brantford? Well, I'm not gonna look for it because we have to hustle. But uh, you can see these numbers are correct. Um, one of the things that we do, our, our, when we do our, in, our, our intake of clients, uh, the snapshot that we, we first take with the, the family details, is if the child is over 18, that, that 48,000 number, we look to see whether we can get their benefits increased from 896 to 1169, because they're invariably slotted into room and board, which is 869. And, and it is true that the, the parents, the family are providing a room plus food, room and board. But in a lot of cases, we, we can split this out, we can break this out, because the 1169 is the shelter plus supplementary benefit. And the shelter component is 497. So um, we do two things. One is we set up a lease between the parent and the child. That takes care of the room, generally. And then if they can shop and cook, even with supports, such that the food is not always necessarily provided by the family, well, then we can generally break it out of the board part, too. And uh, Karen... Um, 
that's you can see on the on the on the screen here. Karen is the uh, person that does these these things. We've I think we've done them about 800 times now, and uh, it's an increase of uh, 273 a month. Uh, the next thing we do is we see whether the family, whether the child, uh, should qualify for the disability tax credit, and if the parents are using it, and also the caregiver credit uh, if the child is over 18. Now, up until uh, we'll come to another slide about this, but until 2017. Uh, the child had to reside with the family or the person using the caregiver credit. But in 2017, uh, the reside with criteria was removed because even, even if a child is in uh, a supported living situation or other semi-supported situation, uh, the parents are still the caregivers. You know, that's, that's all there is to it. And they may or may not, the child may or may not be approved for the disability credit it may or may not be transferred to the parent, but the caregiver credit doesn't require approval. Approval, it's just a, a fact of circumstances. And uh, what this means in practice, the thing that fascinates me is that uh, if you look here, you can see that up until 2017, only the 48,000 who are in the room and board situation, only their parents could use the caregiver credit. But as soon as they change the reside with criteria, this means, in my humble opinion, that almost certainly, almost all of the families, 378,000 families, can use the caregiver credit. This is huge. Because what it does is it, it reduces taxes paid by the parent by about $1,000 a year. So, you know, potentially what you have here is 378,802 times 1,000. That's a big number if you add three zeros every year. So this opportunity opened up in 2017. We, we uh, enlighten people and, and also do the, uh, uh, the, the tax credit back filing uh, regularly. And uh, so you can see that, that, that even in this scenario, if it's only since 2017, there's $3,000 recapture. And if the child happens to be 28 and at home and the parents aren't using it, it's approximately an $8,000 recapture plus a thousand a year going forward. And the disability credit for an adult, somebody over 18, uh, the tax reduction is 1,600. So for a 10 year period, which is very common that we find that they're not using it or they did use it and they quit when the child went into a supported living environment, well, the recapture is often $16,000, which is very gratifying. And as well, I won't go into it right now, but it also means that if the, if the child is approved for the disability credit, they can have a registered disability savings plan. And put simply, if they're over 18, if the parent, someone, contributes 1500 a year, the government contributes 4500 it's uh, 3,500 for the grant and uh, 1,000 for the bond because it's based upon the, the, the house, the, the individual's household income, which is ODSP, after age 18. And you can see these other little numbers here that uh, if you make the right contributions and wait the required number of years that uh, invested at a certain rate, that uh, it's substantial. Now, if a child is 18 or approaching age 18, a lot of parents will understand, they'll they know, they've heard about ODSP. A lot haven't, but still a lot have. And these, this is the criteria that uh, needs to be uh, met. And the most, one, the most common one is can't function in a competitive workplace or can't manage in the community or handle personal care in a, in a more dire situation. And these are the benefits that are received. And the, the person can also receive, well, I'll go on to another, another, another page for that. But the, the, the gifts over time, over a 12-month period, was increased uh, September 1st, 2017, to $10,000 over 12 months. And the asset, 
<clears throat> asset test. Was raised to 40,000 40, per person. Now, uh, everybody who's registered will, will be getting uh, the copy of the link to this video, plus all the PowerPoint slides. The most recent thing that's happened as of September 27th is that there is now a caregiver benefit. It's a follow on to the changes after CERB and after uh, the COVID benefits. So if, if you're uh, your child or a child under 18 or a child with disabilities of any age or an elderly parent such as a dependent of some sort um, if you have to uh, stay home to take care of them <clears throat> and if in the in 2020 or 2019 you earned five thousand dollars because it's only for people who earned five thousand dollars in each of those years or one of those years then you can receive for up to 26 weeks that your child can't go to school can't go to programs or they're at home and the uh, the psw caregiver can't come into the home uh, you can receive um up to five well up, it is five hundred dollars uh, per week so this is a big change. Of course, it um, it doesn't deal with uh, all of the other caregivers that have never worked, or or the caregivers who have never never worked, whose husbands or wives have worked overtime. Uh, it doesn't just doesn't fit that scenario. Uh, are there any questions so far? Parent sets up an RESP, but the child has a disability and is now 18. Can you transfer the RESPs to an RDSP? Well, the answer is yes. And uh, we're going to do um, a webcast on uh, November 10th at seven o'clock on, on just exactly this topic. RESPs, RDSPs, OSAP, um, accommodations for post-secondary, that kind of thing. Is ODSP applicable only for adults greater than 18? Yes. Uh, for the recovery caregiver benefit, does it apply only to individuals who qualify the dis for the disability credit? No, just, just someone with a disability or a child under 12 or a dependent older who does not qualify for the disability credit. Uh, the criteria for the disability tax credit is that uh, they are markedly restricted in some way. Maybe it says that on this slide, let's just see. No, that's the caregiver credit. Um, if, if you're markedly restricted in some way, either cognitively, emotionally, physically, and it's a marked restriction or it takes you substantially longer or you can't set and keep goals or you need constant supervision or you have mobility issues, um, uh, eating, eliminating, dressing, bathing, walking, you know, the more physical ones. Uh, those all qualify for the disability tax credit. It's uh, it's not an easy hustle, but um, uh, it applies to many people. There's last time I looked, there were about 600,000 people in Canada approved. Uh, not all of them ha would have an RDSP because uh, you can only get the matching grants and bonds up until age 49, and of course RDSPs only came in in 2008. So we have people that have aged out of that program already. Uh, this is just about the uh, the lines uh, to look at. If you want to check the disability credit transferred from your child, it's line 318. And one of the interesting things that we do is uh, we, we try once we've we've had a main focus on the on the family and the child with the focus on the child. We try to sort of lift our noses up from our desk. And what you do is you look at the elderly parent. Like I have uh, parents uh, who, whose child lives with them until they're deceased, right? It's not that unusual. And sometimes it can be advantageous for everybody because they can all stay together longer because their child with certain disabilities, um, cognitive, for example, developmental, 
um, can still help carry the groceries, they can still shovel the walk, uh, but they uh, wouldn't know how to drive, the, they could drive the car perhaps, but, but they wouldn't know how to get to where they're going and back again, that kind of thing. But they can drive if they're told where to go, maybe. So you can see that the parents and the child might well be able to remain at home in the same home longer than they could otherwise, certainly independently. As far as the uh, the caregiver credit, let's see if that uh, the lines are shown. No, they're not. Um, the caregiver credit for those who have a child who's over 18 and not living with them, uh, you can use this credit even so after 2017, as I've just said. And the the line item that is used to line on in the in the in the T1 return has changed over the last few years. If you are using it in 2019, it's line 30450. And that's for 2019. In 2017 and 18, it's line 30700. And if it's 2016 and, and, and sooner, or older, I guess, then it's line 315. So those are the lines to check. 318 for the disability credit. And for 2019, 30450. For the two years prior to that, 307. And prior to that, 315. This is a more slightly more detailed about RDSPs. Uh, this is a, a discussion about after the child turns 18. Normally up until age 18, the parents often uh, get uh, cooperation and support from uh, doctors, hospitals. So for the personal care side, it's not usually that difficult with minors. Uh, doctors and hospitals still nevertheless think that they know what's best. And of course they don't, you do. Uh, the way I, I discuss this in my seminars is that um, if you, uh, well, simply put, the families have skin in the game, right? But slightly more, you know, more amusing uh, presentation, let's say. If you put all of the well-intentioned supporting professionals on the one hand and the family on the other hand, and you put it in the context of an egg and bacon breakfast, well, the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed, and that's true. You know, all of the doctor, all the well-intentioned doctors and social workers and psychologists and uh, whatever you may be dealing with, they're not the parent. You're the one that has the, the binder, the folder, the box, stuffed with every test and every doctor's name and the phone number and the results of that medication, and then when they switched it, you know, you've got all this, and what you do, it's especially amusing to me, when you wind up running into residents, young, smart, motivated resident doctors, helpers, and, you know, you're the one educating them. And at the same time, you're making sure that they don't screw up so your child is not injured. No, 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 we've, we've tried that medicine, it made her turn green. <laughs> I'm being humorous, but the point is, you know, and they don't know. They're just repeatedly making the same mistakes unless they've read the complete file and they haven't because you've got everything. Anyway, that's my rant for the day. So, so what this means is that when the child turns 18, all of a sudden, uh, a lot of things are okay still. Uh, you can be the, uh, the trustee for ODSP, not a problem. Uh, you can be the account holder on the RDSP if your child is not competent. If they are competent, but it would be much better if you were the account holder, uh, then you need them to sign a power of attorney appointing you, the two of you. Um, as time goes by, uh, you, are, you are truly the substitute decision maker for health care. Uh, but only if the child is not competent. And there can be lots of cases where the child is competent, but they're still a child. 
they're inexperienced, unsophisticated, and perhaps marginally competent or marginally not competent. Do they understand the implications? So one thing to understand is something is another thing to understand the implications. So firstly, you would look at powers of attorney once they're 18. Uh, this is a good thing to do. We do a lot of that. It's very inexpensive. And it'll allow you to have a little more standing as your legal representative. Uh, but a lot of the work we do deals with uh, legal guardianship. Uh, Diane, if you happen to think of any horror stories that have brought people to us, if you want to chime in, feel free. Because uh, we do a lot of these. Uh, we started initially back in 2009 because the way the, the, way the practice has, has evolved is that we've just, over time, gradually seen the kinds of services that our families need and either we, we knew how to, how to deliver those services or we learned how to deliver those services. So in 2009, we figured out how to do legal guardianships. And now we do them all over the province uh, from Ottawa. It's uh, filed in the court here because it's, uh, it's a jurisdiction of the superior court rather than uh, the residence of anybody, like a probate application might be. And so they're all filed here. They're all called uh, bucket applications. Uh, they're fairly expensive, so we don't try to sell them. You know, if we can find some practical alternative that will get the family to where they want to go more economically, um, we're perfectly good with that. But there's a lot of cases, like, for example, something that's just started to happen more frequently now is uh, uh, the LINs, uh, health uh, service uh, providers, local health uh, initiative, whatever is LINs. Uh, they, um, have a program now for family managed uh, for care funding. Well, if the child's over 18 but not competent, they have to be their legal guardian. So we've got three of those files in the last two weeks. And you know, it's, it's all good work, it's all nice clean work, it's always successful. Um, and what it does really is it prepares the situation so that when the parents are gone, Although they have it okay now, you know, they, they get cooperation, not really much of a, of a problem. When the parents are gone, just as you have to have a will with the hands and trust to put money aside and um, not, not uh, disqualify someone from ODSP and, you know, provide for them. But the, uh, the, if, there's, if the parents aren't alive, then you need somebody who is the legal representative to be the account holder on the RDSP, because no one else is authorized. And you know, you need someone to manage the RDSP and the investment of the several hundred thousand dollars that it winds up holding. And then when the child turns 60, you need to have somebody to receive the money. And then when the child turns 65, you need someone to apply for old age security and guaranteed income supplements, because now they're a senior citizen and they lose ODSP. And in some cases uh, that we will come to, you can see that there are pensions from a parent, a teacher, municipal employee, power generator, generator hydro, or workman's, uh, WSIB workman's comp employees, where the child, after the parent dies, second parent dies, the child receives a pension as an adult dependent survivor. Well, who is going to be the legal representative to apply for it and to manage that? I spoke to uh, a fellow today. He is uh, retired from WSIB. Most of these pensions are approximately 50%, but WSIB is two thirds of his pension. So his daughter was completely incapable. So of course the discussion was about guardianship, right? Um, She'll, she'll get two thirds, 33,000 pension. And so of course she, she'll lose ODSP, but, but she will have uh, other drug coverages with his group plan afterwards. So the issue for the Henson Trust in his will and his wife's will isn't, isn't so much uh, protection of ODSP. And, and that was part of our discussion. His estate is sizable, you know, a few million. How much does he need to leave for her? 
well, how much should he leave from, a, from an estate planning tax protection and minimization standpoint? Because if she's not with them, she'll be in a, in a supported living group home. And her needs are going to be extremely modest. So what, how much do you fund the trust with? But more, than, more to the point, who's going to apply for the, the WSIB pension and receive the 33000 a year? And it's actually fascinating. I'm just sort of going off. I'll come to these slides later. But with what happens here is she gets the $33,000 pension. She is off ODSP. She needs a very minimal amount of it, although it may be necessary to negotiate with the supported living provider uh, such that right now the, the supported living provider receives her 1169 ODSP. It's only the parents at home that get the 896. Anywhere else gets the full amount. It's just not the parents that get the 1169. I thought I'd just let it pause there for a second. So what would happen is uh, all of a sudden she's not on ODSP, but she has 33,000 pension. Uh, will we have to negotiate with that service provider, community living, bunch of dimes, providing services, you know, well, we have to uh, pay an equivalent. But either way, it won't be 33000 a year that is needed to support her. So let's just say that, uh, you know, it's, it's 14000 that we have to uh, ante up for the caregiver, let's just say. Uh, so that's uh, 14 taken away from 33. So that will then be managed by the guardian for the remainder of the lifetime of the child, the sister, and it'll be invested and it'll accumulate for how many decades? One decade, two decades, three decades? And then that person will die and they're not competent to do a will. So they'll die intestate. And then by succession law, if they have siblings, siblings will get that money, plus anything that may remain from the RDSP. So all of a sudden you start to see that this is a larger family uh, agenda here, initiative. And of course the primary focus is the well-being of the child. And that's why the, the practice that we have here is such a long-lived extended practice because all of these things need to be managed over decades. And you need to have an idea of what's going to happen, not just uh, find it out next week. So here's a little bit of information about powers of attorney for personal care. And this is powers of attorney for property. And even if, they're, even if the child can't sign a power of attorney, they're not competent, then for health care, but only health care, not property, uh, there is a, a, a hierarchy of substitute decision makers under the legislation. And the simplest, simplest statement here is that it's uh, the parents um, and, and then siblings and so on. The problem is that... Um, even though legally, statutorily, you may be the substitute decision maker, that doesn't give you the same clout that legal guardianship gives you with the doctors and hospitals. They're just as able to ignore you as they wish, especially if the child hasn't been found not competent. Because until they're found not competent, you're presumed to be competent. Although most people would know that this person is marginally competent, for example, for example. And this is some information about legal guardianship. Uh, this one granted through statute, this is, this is statutory guardianship, which comes into effect if a person is found not competent, for example, by a psychiatrist, because they're having you know, psych psych psychotic episodes and they're found to be not competent by the psychiatrist, 
and then the, the statutory guardian, the public, gar public guardian and trustee automatically steps in and becomes their guardian. But uh, I won't go into details or examples from this particular time, but uh, it's not the best choice. And a court application for guardianship status uh, involves um, legal fees. It involves two capacity assessments by capacity assessors. There's fees for that. And then there's a court filing fee and a couple mi minor fees for the court filing and a minor, minor fee for the, uh, the public guardian to review the application and make their, their comments on it uh, to the for the judge's consideration. Uh, you can see here that uh, guardianship is only applicable if uh, the person uh, is not competent. And uh, the, main, the main use of it is after the parents are, have gone, whether, when they're deceased. But in my experience, uh, the parents say, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to leave that to, to Jane, his sister. I'm not going to leave that to Jane. We'll, we'll do it now. Uh, this is the uh, pension planning side of it. This particular slide doesn't have the workman's comp but work WSIB on it. Uh, um, Karen, would you make a note to have Christiane add WSIB to this? It's uh, slide 17. And what happens here is uh, if uh, a person fits into one of these provincial statutory pensions, and it's, it's the same across the, across the country in most provinces that I'm aware of, uh, these are all public statutory pensions. So by, by provincial statute, there is a pension. Um, teachers get good pensions. Uh, municipal employees don't get the same pensions. They get much lesser pensions. Um, hydro workers get good pensions. If you work at uh, Bruce Nuclear, you're going to get a pretty good pension, almost no matter what you do. And uh, Workman's Comp gets, uh, they get a pretty good pension, not, not huge, but but it's two thirds, not half. These ones, other ones are generally 50%. And now with respect to OMERS, the municipal pensions, um, a lot of times 50% of the OMERS pension is a fair bit less than ODSP. So all that it does is offset the 1169, it doesn't do, have any real advantage. Uh, sometimes it's not so bad. I have clients down around Picton, for example, where they're both municipal employees. So the child will get half of two pensions, a little better. Uh, you can appreciate also that there's lots of teachers who marry teachers. So there's two teachers pensions, which means a full pension, which could easily be 60 grand. You see what the questions are like. The value up to 18,000 recapture for 10 years, yes. It's about 16,000, it's about 1,600 a year. Uh, Karen, did you want to speak to that? Uh, does the doctor need to complete anything to qualify for the disability to credit? Yes, it's uh, form T2201. Well, what if they don't have a family doctor? Well, these are all the practical ob obstacles that everybody faces. Uh, that's why we do it. Sometimes if you have a specialist you deal with, they'll do the forms for you. Yeah. I can't go on like promises, but sometimes they'll do it. That's true. Is the government contribution of a thousand per year in bonds, does this depend on household income of the 18, under 18 child's parents? Uh, yes, um, household income, last I looked, it changes a little bit each year, but last I looked, the thousand dollar bond is available if the household income is under 24,000. So in most cases, that would just be the child over 18. But I, you know, obviously, I have a family in um, Maple, Ontario, where the household income is very modest. There's two children with autism. Uh, the father is uh, collecting workman's comp because he was injured, injured at work. That's all their income is. And uh, even his income at the time, this is a few years ago now, but even his income was $30,000. And even though it's not taxable, 
it's, it's still adjusted net income. So it would still affect the uh, the thousand dollar bond. The uh, the thirty five hundred dollar grant uh, is affected if uh, household income is greater than ninety five thousand. I'll have to get some more current numbers and put them on the chart, but that's about ninety five thousand. So lots of households with two working parents are greater than ninety five thousand. And above that, it's only a thousand for a thousand. So, if you contribute a thousand, you get a thousand. So, my normal advice is to open up the RDSP, get get yourself on the mailing list, but don't contribute. Because, in my experience, typically, in, you know, even that thousand a year, there may be lots of households or grandparents who who could certainly contribute that thousand a year. And if you if you can, great, go ahead. But otherwise. Wait till the child is 18. Um, then it's based on their income, their income of 14,000, for example. And um, you'll get the maximum bang for your buck over the next 20 years with 1,500 and 3,500 plus 1,000. So, you know, wait till the child is 18. My pediatrician completed the disability credit paperwork for me. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that brings most people to the door, because of course they don't know about the tax credits until we tell them, and they may have heard about the benefit increases, but they don't quite know how it works. Uh, what, what really motivates people, and yet they're not prompt to complete, is uh, wills with hence and trusts in them. And uh, the, the wording, specific wording, that makes them different from other trusts is that the trustee must have absolute and unfettered discretion and the asset shall not vest in the child. Uh, there's also a, a rebuttal of the even-handed rule and a few other things that you know tweak it, but these are the critical aspects. And you, you'll find that, uh, my, my experience is that you, you won't find that it says in your will, if you think you have a Hanson Trust, it, you know, it typically doesn't say Hanson Trust. If you have a trust, it's possible that it is a Henson Trust, but this is the wording to look for. And if you're really stuck, I'll review things for you if you want. Uh, the size of the trust is unlimited. There is no limitation. There's a, a, a popular misconception that the trust is limited to 100,000. And of course, these days, uh, the, the share of the estate for the child is often more than 100,000. And that the disbursements may be limited because what people have heard is that uh, uh, that there's a ten thousand dollar gift rule, uh, or, and and there is there's a ten thousand dollars over twelve month gift rule. That is true. You, you, you're, theoretically, you can only give ten thousand over twelve months, not annually, but twelve months directly to the child or traceable to the child through their bank account, that kind of thing. Most parents simply give cash to the child if there's any doubt, but. There is no such limit on the size of the trust or the disbursements from the trust for a Henson Trust. And it does two things. One is it protects ODSP benefits, but also it appoints one or more trustees to manage the money, invest it, disperse it, and also then to make one final disbursement when the child dies. It's typically a sibling that is the trustee. Uh, you do have to have some discussion or caution perhaps because of course the uh, surviving trustee uh, surviving uh, siblings who are who would may perhaps be the trustees they uh, get the residue of the trust so if you have an absolute and unfettered discretion as to whether to give something or nothing and uh, to be charitable you have a, an abundance of caution let's say well, then, of course, there'll be more left for you than yours when your brother dies. But that, that's a factor we have to consider. There's a, a built-in potential conflict here. Uh, but in practice, it's rarely a real conflict. Um, it says, in order to... Uh, Karen, do you want to answer this one about... Uh, in order for the purpose of setting up estate planning, what is the cost? Do you want to speak to that? 
Uh, yeah, I could. I just was sending her an email back or the person an email back. Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, but if they want to email me, um, and I will send them the family details, and we can have initial consult to unpack things, because um, each family is different on what their needs are. That's right. Ken, uh, Ken goes through everything, and you know, from there you can decide. Yeah. Normally, the initial short consult is uh, is, is a courtesy consult. Uh, if a child with autism gets disability tax credit, good. Will the child receive ODSP automatically when they reach age 18? No. It's a separate thing. The disability tax credit is a federal non-refundable tax credit that's used on your tax return. ODSP is a provincial financial and, and medical benefit that you have to apply for. Do you want to speak, speak any further to that, Karen? To the last one? Yeah. No, I, th uh, I think you answered it pretty quickly. Okay. Um, but the DTC, once they're approved, they get an extra little bit on their child tax benefits. But that's only up to 18. And that's when we make the transition to ODSB. Okay. Uh, it says, is there any homeowner's plan specific to the dis to disability when we are planning to buy a property? Well, that's that's a whole discussion. Uh, if your if your if your real if your real question has to do with can we use the RDSP to buy a home? At present, the answer is no. Uh, there's a whole report that's been put together uh, by Community Living, I think it is, proposing that this be one of the allowable things that you do rather than receive disbursements over a period of time. Uh, as it's structured right now, um, at age 60, sooner but not later than age 60, uh, the, uh, the RDSP will start to be dispersed over a 23-year period. And that's it. I mean, that's not quite true. There, there are some, there's one other set of circumstances where you can get payments in advance. But uh, the, what's going to happen to almost everybody is that it'll be paid out over a 23 year period. And there is talk about um, using, some, using it for something comparable to the uh, uh, self-administered RRSP mortgage, for example, where you have a, an RRSP with a couple hundred grand in it. And instead of having to solely invest it in other things, other people's investments, uh, you can give yourself a mortgage on your home uh, and then gradually pay it back to the RRSP without uh, losing, you know, without withdrawing the money as income. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, there are um, a number of families who have a sufficient uh, income and also have sizable RRSPs and RIFs. Now it's true that at age 71, you're obliged to, to deregister, remove, take out um, a percentage, a growing percentage of the, of the RIF and declare it as income. Uh, but this, uh, this goes on over a number of years. And it could, I, I find that uh, in a lot of these plans where, for example, a client friend of mine um, a lot of times people who know they'll have a pension don't put money into an RRSP, but <coughs> uh, some do. And other people have a, other good solid in, in income investments perhaps. And they of course have, have in fact contributed substantially to their RRSPs. And what they know is that when they die, they may well be a sizable amount of uh, money riffs in this, riff money in this, in the riff. And of course, if, if you're the surviving spouse, the second to die, and you die, well, then the RIF falls into your in income that year, and it's taxed at the rate of all of your income in that year, which could be, in some circumstances, 50%. So if it's a half a million dollar RIF, and the circumstances are correct, and you can, you can often predict this, how this is going to shake out, um, then you'll lose 250 grand. Whereas if you set up a lifetime benefit trust, it's designed to receive your registered funds on a deferred basis, much like a so-called so rollover. It's not really a rollover, but a rollover to your spouse, for example. And um, it's, it's received by the lifetime benefit trust. And the trustee can only do one thing. Uh, they have to buy a qualifying annuity. And there's certain factors in that annuity, but the fact is that the annuity pays to the trust 
but the amount paid to the trust, which is all income, because it's a RIF, uh, is automatically and must be attributed to the beneficiary, the child with special needs. So what this means is that instead of paying a large lump sum, perhaps up to half of the amount of the RIF upon death, and, and instead of trying to leave it to the child directly because they can't manage it and they would lose ODSP, you, if the child has developmental cognitive disabilities, you can set up a lifetime benefit trust and you can have this uh, RIF passed to the hands of the trustee. There's a process for this, of course. And they purchase an annuity and the annuity makes payments of, let's say, for simplicity, uh, based upon their age and the size of the RIF, uh, $20,000 a year. So what happens is, the 20,000 is received each year by the trust. It can be dispersed, of course, but the $20,000 is attributed, declared in the hands of the beneficiary, the child. Well, in most of these cases, the child's gonna have a personal tax credit of 13,229, just like you, and the disability tax credit of approximately 8,400. So that's uh, $21,000 roughly of tax credits. The income, meanwhile, is only 20,000. So there's no taxes paid ever versus paying the sizable amount up to half of the original amount of the RIF upon death. So this is a very interesting thing. Now this, these are examples, they're slightly complicated. I don't think I'll go through them in detail, but you can see here the sample I, I used was a $500,000 RIF, taxes of 250. This is very simplistic, right? So you buy a $500,000 RIF, uh, sorry, uh, annuity, and you build in a guarantee period, and the payments are, based upon the age of the child, which would vary, of course, 24864 a month, and it's guaranteed for 20 years. Could pay longer, it's a, it could pay life, would, it would pay life. But if the child died prematurely, it, it is guaranteed for 20 years. Now this, this isn't completely correct, um, because certain things happen when the child dies, so I won't go into it. But for example purposes, you can see that here we have a, a basic amount, and uh, Karen, um, Please have Christian update this uh, this uh, slide too. The uh, ta basic amount tax credit is now thirteen thousand two twenty nine. Okay. And uh, and and you have her use the uh, the real current number for the disability credit, but the, the eight thousand four hundred is is pretty pretty close. So you can see what would happen is that if the, if this person has a twenty thousand dollar tax credit, only four thousand eight sixty four would be taxable. It's taxed at 22% because that's the rate. So the taxes are 1,070. And over those 20 years, for example purposes, the taxes in total would be 21,000 compared to 250,000. You can see that this has its own charm. And it's interesting to me because when we first started doing these some years ago, you can you can appreciate that that it's it's not not a surprise to find that someone who has more than adequate other income by whatever means and also a substantial riff didn't come by it lightly you know I, I mean it might have dropped into the hands of the surviving spouse it it could have been created by her husband who died first. This is true. But the whole package was put together by somebody who's astute. So when we first started discussing these things with people, the advantages are obvious. But they weren't prepared to do them. Although they knew there was a certainty in death, they weren't prepared to do them on the basis that if the child died early, the money could be lost or there'd be no, no, no advantage, no benefit. So we, we had to satisfy that, that emotional concern 
by building an, a, a lease to guarantee period. And you can see here that 24,864, which is a whole lot like 25,000 times 20 years is 500,000. Does that make sense? Uh, this is another one. This is a smaller one, which would be more common. And you can see here that here, the potential loss at the top rate is 137,000. And if you purchase uh, uh, an annuity, it would pay 13,200, depending upon the age of the child. And that is less than the tax credit. So there's zero taxes payable. And that this would be a more common arrangement. Um, I'll touch on these briefly. We're just touching eight o'clock. We have uh, 33 people still. We had 34 at the high tide, so that's not bad. It must be doing something right. And uh, these are just words that you might want to know about. Um, a graduated rate estate allows an estate, after someone dies, the estate trust has three years, 36 months actually, to uh, to settle up the estate. And uh, <clears throat> during those years, if money is not attributed out to the beneficiaries to have it declared in their hands at a lesser rate, it pays tax at marginal rates like an individual, but like testamentary trust used to before 2016. So about 22% tax on the first 45,000 and then 33% on the next 45 approximately, and 44,000 on 44% on the next 45,000, it's roughly. And um, so if you have to declare the income in the hands of the trust, of the estate trust, then it's at that graduated rate, which can be in certain circumstances that still ad advantageous. And uh, a qualifying disability trust is simply a testamentary trust where the beneficiary qualifies for the disability tax credit, it too, in perpetuity. The Henson Trust with the beneficiary approved for the disability credit can elect, if it would, if, if it wishes, to be a, a QDT, QDT, and it too forever can, can pay tax at graduated rates. Uh, what you normally do, though, is you don't do that. What you do is you attribute the income by preferred beneficiary election to the beneficiary who, as you can see in these earlier examples, has about $20,000 in tax credits. Why, why would you pay tax at a graduated rate when you can pay nothing on the first 20,000? And of course, in most cases, the trust income attributed to the child is less than 20,000. If you had a $500,000 trust at 4%, that's 20,000 income per year, each year. You know, and uh, there are trusts bigger than a half million or that earn more than four points. But you can see this is gonna satisfy most of the, of the community. And um, it is still the case that um, a testamentary trust set up following a death it can own a home the child if the child lives in it. It qualifies as a principal residence, capital gains, tax-free exemption. Uh, used to be that we could do the same thing uh, with what's called an inter vivis trust uh, set up while alive, but um, in 2016, the government changed that too. And uh, finally, this is the contact information. Uh, if you wanna contact the officer, ask a question, uh, contact Karen. If you'd like to speak to Michelle, contact Michelle. Uh, we have a whole lot of uh, archived uh, videos and podcasts on the, on the website. And we have a question here. Can a child with ACSD lose eligibility for RDSP at some point time of renewal? If yes, what happens to the funds? Uh, Karen, do you want to answer that question? Oh. I could try my best. I know that uh, a lot of times children, they have a renewal period of, I think it's every five years. And yeah. so usually they do get renewed, but 
honestly, Ken, I don't know exactly uh, what happens to the RDSP. I think we just turn it into an RRSP. Well, the rules changed recently. Um, it is possible that, as silly as it may be, it is possible that, for example, a child who's uh, approved for the disability credit at a young age uh, is, is approved only till age 18. I've seen this. Uh, so you have to reapply. Normally, you're successful reapplying. Normally, that's what we find. Sometimes people do come to us saying that they've tried, they have failed, you know, and uh, can we help them? So we do. And normally, we get things sorted out. We, we, I don't want to blow my own horn too, too loudly, but if you do things correctly and you know the answers to the questions before they ask them, well, then you give them the answers before they ask them and they say, oh, okay. So, you know, we would, would be very rare for us not to succeed in this kind of thing. But yes, it does happen that you have to re refresh the disability credit. And it used to be that if you lost the disability credit approval, uh, that you had up to five years to reinstate it. Uh, during that five years, the RDSP didn't have to be collapsed. Otherwise, if you, if, if you didn't specifically ask for this uh, uh, re arrangement, then after a year, it was collapsed. And we had a couple of people get caught in the middle when the rules changed. But uh, the rules now is that um, all the money you've contributed, obviously, even if it was collapsed, the child would get back your money and the growth, but the grants and bonds would be repaid to the government. But the rules now are, as of 2020, that if you lose the disability tax credit approval, it all stops. You can't continue, you can't continue to contribute. You get no more grants and bonds, but you don't have to collapse it and you don't have to give back the grants and bonds. And you know, we, we do have family situations where there's some concern about how long they're realistically how long their child will live. And if you if you know that this is a risk, like if you have a child with Rett syndrome, for example, well you might you just might contribute for 10 years, not contribute for the full 20, but contribute for 10, stop all contributions, and you'd have to also stop the bond, right? You'd have to stop the bond, which goes in even if you don't contribute. And then you have to wait 10 years for the grants and bonds for the first 10 year period to vest, so that if the child does, God forbid, does die in year 21, you don't have to give all the money back. And now, you know, because the, the, the dis disqualification from the tax credit rule about not having to collapse and return the grants and bonds, that's for the disability tax credit rule. It doesn't apply if you die, if the child dies. So you'd have to um, massage this situation in some cases uh, appropriately. Uh, if the child does die, then by succession law, presuming they have no will, by succession law, the money goes back first to their parents, and then if no if parents are predeceased, um, then to their siblings, if any, uh, and if siblings but predeceased, then to their children, if any, and then it goes up the line and over the over and across and down, and uh, ultimately could ha could wind up by succession law in the hands of the cousins who never came to visit. Uh, for disability estate planning, this is the last question, guys. Uh, for disability estate planning, is for somebody local in Sudbury you can recommend? Uh, sure, go to a financial advisor, go to a lawyer, um, see if you can figure out what if they if you, if see if you can determine if they know what they're talking about. Uh, normally, what happens is people watch these videos, and then they go and they tell the lawyers or advisors what to do. Uh, your alternative to that, of course, is to engage us. Uh, we have a number of clients in Sudbury. Our, our clientele are proportionate to the population areas in the province. So, for example, if there's 13.7 million uh, people in, in, in Ontario, and if Ottawa has a population of a million, well, then proportionally one in 13.7 of our clients are in this area. And in some cases, 
the, it's, it's disproportionate, like in Sudbury or Windsor, uh, places that I've done seminars before, uh, places where my client families, you know, I've taken my name in vain with other families. Uh, but uh, as I said at the very start, it's, it's a, a provincial and interprovincial practice. Thanks to COVID, uh, we can now uh, witness affidavits and sign wills remotely. Um, doesn't happen all the time by any means, but all of, the, all of this stuff is now done remotely. It used to be done remotely before, just not by webcast, by video. Uh, the wills were signed and uh, signed by witnesses in your hometown, in your home, perhaps, and then uh, sent back to us. And, uh, and of course, all the tax work is done by us online or by any, by any tax representative. It's all done online. Uh, probate filings are now online in all the courthouses. All the guardianship applications are all online, remotely, digitally. Uh, what else? That's just how the world is these days. Um, I think that's the last question. We have 31 people, so we've had a good retention rate here. That's always gratifying. It's now uh, 8.10. 8, uh, Michelle, do you want to say any final words? Um, anything you'd like to say? I should have, should have warned you sooner, right? But uh, I just want to thank everybody for attending, and I really uh, hope that you do feel free to reach out to either Kenneth or myself to get further information. And if you do require um, some more information or would like some more of these particular topics, please reach out as well so we can get that going for you. So I thank you again for attending and thank you, Kenneth, for everything that you've done for Autism Ontario. Thank your dedication you. and commitment has been amazing. And uh, we thank you and your team for everything that you've done for us. Thank you. And uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, wouldn't be a bad idea if we didn't do this sort of thing by quarterly or some annually or something like that very important information to get out there to families and professionals i know that i know that there were a lot of other families we, we both know that that a lot of other families clearly indicated their interest but didn't register if we had we had 39 registered i think that we had what 94 indications of interest so we'll have to maybe see if we can follow up with that game okay well i'm going to turn it off now and i wish everyone a Good night and a, and a good rest and a nice day in the morning. Take care.